company. I'm here today to talk about recent research on process philosophy, process theology, and Buddhism. Um, this paper is part of a larger project, and the project contains six chapters, but today I will present chapter one, which is called Process Thought, Process Philosophy, Process Theology, and Buddhism. And the project is being done as an MCU collaboration with Venerable Dr. Samfong Kunikaru and also uh, Dr. Uh, Sam, uh, Professor Dr. Soraj Ongladaram of Chula Lungkorn. So this is a team project. I have my own part. I'm presenting part one of six parts. Um, so I start off with some definitions. I think you can see them here. Um, yes, that's good. I have uh, two screens you should be able to see from either side. Process philosophy means an adventure in ideas, to borrow a phrase from Alfred North Whitehead, the father of process philosophy, where basic categories such as thing are re-understood as event. A thing is simply a conventional designation for a very long event. For example, um, in the morning, maybe you, like I, take a walk to the lake here at IBSC, and you look at the lake and you think, oh, it's remarkable in its beauty, in its natural flow. But actually, the thing we call event, the thing we call an object, the lake, is not fixed and static. It's always developing and it has developed before. So process thought, broadly, to include philosophy and religion, um, gives you a new way of looking at reality. Process theology means a way of understanding God in which deity is re-understood as actively relating with humans in the co-creative process of creating the world. Process thought means both of these. It's understood in non-binary terms, not either or, not either as a philosophy or as a religion. And Buddhism means Theravada Buddhism, especially Sutta Pitaka, wherein the teachings of the Buddha are explained in Buddhist lectures and discussions, um, not exclusively as a philosophy or as a religion. In modernity, Buddhism is studied in many academic departments as an interdisciplinary phenomenon. You see here a beautiful picture of the Buddha and a portrait of Alfred North Whitehead. What are some differences between perfect being theology and process theology? Whitehead, who lived from 1861 to 1947, was a leading process philosopher of religion who brought objections to the traditional concept of God when understood as a maximally great perfect being. On the view of process thought, we have an alternative to defending perfect being theology against the problem of evil, for example. Process theology articulates a concept of God that is not static, not unchanging and transcendent to the world, but instead is a dynamic force constantly changing in the process of becoming in the world. The world is, on this view, an emergent entity caused by human divine co-creative activity instead of God being out of the world and only affecting humans and the world, God is considered to be imminent within the world, interacting with people and co-creating the world. The focus in process thought is becoming whereas the traditional focus of perfect being theology, actually going way back to Plato, 
they had being as the focus. But now in modern thinking, becoming is the focus. And this um, fits with Buddhism in several ways. The problem of evil in perfect being theology is found um, in this way. In the first edition of a famous philosophy of religion text uh, by John Hick, God is thought of in the old school way. He's all powerful, all good, all holy, all wise, personal, loving, creator, savior, and transcendent to the world. Philosophers of religion have wondered in recent times if all these attributes are logically consistent. Uh, David Hume shows the dialogue between these positions. How's, how's the voice? Can you hear me out there? It's okay. Um, showing in his dialogues the different positions of skeptic in Philo, the anthropomorphic believer thinking that God is like a man, uh, Cleanthes, and the mystical position of Demea. Readers see in this dialogue how the disagreements between these positions emerge. So one way to think about it as a conversation between different positions. And uh, Whitehead asks us to suppose that God, instead of being out of this world as a tr transcendent supernatural deity, coexists in the natural world with humans and co-creates the world by skillful cooperative endeavor. He thinks of it as a kind of thought experiment or adventure in ideas. Uh, this is um, a well-known um, image associated with William Blake, where God is this transcendent deity. The process God is not subject to the problem of evil, and this is a good starting point for seeing its value. According to the process concept of God, God is imminent in the world, and consequently the problem of evil does not arise there. Briefly, the problem is this. One, if God is all good, then God would want to eliminate all evil. Two, if God is all powerful, then God would be able to eliminate all evil. Three, but evil exists. Therefore, God cannot be both all-powerful and all-good. Try to think this through, this idea of an imminent God in the world, with this picture, wherein we can perhaps see God as imminent in nature. A question arises, are the attributes of omniscience and immutability logically compatible? They would have to be if the old, process, if the old perfect being theology were correct. Does it make good sense? A philosopher named Norman Kretzmann uh, has argued that this combination of attributes is logically impossible in a famous article titled Omniscience and Immutability. When considered as transcendent to the world, the concept of God as perfect being see, seems flawed in light of the problem of evil. By contrast, according to process thinking, God is not transcendent but imminent in the world, and consequently that problem doesn't arise. Um, the background of the process thought movement uh, began, I think, with Whitehead, but was developed through several thinkers, including um, most notably in a way that people can understand. 
in a book called Process Relational Philosophy, An Introduction to Alfred North Whitehead by C. Robert Mesley. Mesley has been the most powerful interpreter in modernity to show the implications of this with lots of examples and clear explanations. Recent process thought, in thinking with Whitehead, we can see new ways of thinking about God that are consistent with both modern Buddhist and modern Christian views of the world. It's the objective of this ongoing research contribution to show whether and to what extent there are similarities, differences, and convergences between process thought and Buddhism. So I think myself that process view holds remarkable opportunities to narrate what's important and accessible in Buddhism for a contemporary audience. One point that is very clear in process thought is that what's important in reality is not supernatural, not unreachable, but what's important in reality is consciousness transformed as you might think of the Buddha experiencing his enlightenment in the natural world. So I say simply, enlightenment is natural. Nibbana, Sa, Upadisesa, with the five aggregates intact. Then you also have Nibbana after death in the case of a Tathagata, An Upadisesa Nibbana. But the basis for everything is whether or not a person now can experience Nibbana with the attributes, with the aggregates intact. Another way to look at things is with Paul Griffiths. He has written a contribution called Buddha and God, a contrastive study in ideas about maximal greatness. Compared comparing Buddha and God. On Griffith's view, God is maximally great because of his divine creativity, but Buddha is maximally great because of his perfect tranquility. They are, you might say, two sides of the same coin of deity, like the yin and yang, complementary opposites, but in each case, the model of goodness is done in its own way. So, um, two sides of the same coin of deity understood in a very different way. One in terms of action, action, creativity happening by divine agency. Uh, the other being the idea of the Buddha, tranquility, <coughs> perfect tranquility, reaching uh, the depths of spirituality. I've left out most of the technical terminology concerning Whitehead. In fact, it's so dense that if you read Process of Reality, as I did uh, about 10 years ago with American graduate students, you probably need a lexicon, a dictionary of Whitehead terms, and one has been created. Whitehead on concrescence and persuasive influence. I make an exception here and give you a couple of technical terms. In the viewpoint of process thought explained by him, uh, by Whitehead, God interacts with humans in concrescence, that is, a process of becoming, evolving, and self-actualizing in co-creating the world. How does God do this? By persuasive influence, instead of by coercion, by luring people to goodness, not as a kind of transcendent judge who is going to cudgel them if they disobey. So in doing this, he helps people uh, achieve noble values, knowing their own subjective aim, wherein each entity has a purpose and God inspires them to achieve God's image of goodness and creativity by relational aspect also, in which a person's place in the network 
of interrelationships constituting the world is taken into account. Let's think together about environmental degradation. Whitehead's vision, can't promise it, sorry, Whitehead's vision as expressed in his magnum opus, Process and Reality, shows the urgency in seeing the world as a network of interrelated processes. It is urgent because of the extent of the environmental de degradation caused by human agency affecting, as you all know, the oceans, lakes, trees, and the trigger for this unskillful action is greed, pa passion, hatred, and confusion. In Pali Buddhist Kama, there is a parallel to Whitehead's thought in which all of our choices and actions have consequences in a network of interrelated activities. Another way in which we can see um, the similarity between Buddhism and process thought is with the idea of interbeing, to think with Thich Nhat Hanh about this, Patika Samuppada, or dependent co-arising, is also an important concept within process thought. The idea of many dimensions in causally related processes is developed further by John Cobb, who taught and published in a transdisciplinary way on ecology, sustainable development, ethics, and interreligious dialogue. Here I give a um, precising of this. Interdisciplinary means working on a common theme across disciplines, but transdisciplinary is more than that. It means collaboration and cooperation. People get together, for example, in developing new curricula without rote memorization and with innovation in which students and faculty collaborate in order to solve multifaceted problems. Three main elements for process and reality summary is given by Mesley. One, the ability to be actively open and affected by the world around us. Two, the ability to create ourselves out of what we have taken in. And three, the ability to be influenced by those about us having first been affected by them. Wisdom is shown in the reciprocal relations with others. A view we can find in both Buddhism and process thought is that all life is interconnected. And we find contemporary applications for this. For example, plastic waste in seawater <coughs> ruins the undersea world. Similarly, process thinkers are mindful of this type of pollution and will work to end it. Space junk is the next frontier of pollution and futuristic thinkers may well advance their thinking to figure out how the human race is going to avoid as much junk as possible in outer space and which international groups will be responsible for it. Interconnectedness is a key element to realize. The five aggregates, form, feeling, sensations, dispositions, and consciousness that collectively comprise a person may also be used to analyze human interconnectedness, which is a key element in all life. The specific rebirth realms in the rebirth wheel of dependent co-arising analyze what the interconnected realms are, and also monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen in the fourfold sangha are interconnected in their practices of meditation. So here's a way in which everything sort of fits together in conceptual art, causality in Buddha and Whitehead. Now I'm coming to the end, and I give you an overview of this project. Today I just shared chapter one. 
Um, on two, we work on the processes of happiness, that is the four Brahma Viharas. On three, we work on the elimination of unspec unuseful, unhelpful metaphysical questions, as the Buddha did with the ten that he set aside. And um, on, let's see, three and four, we have um, Anicca Anatta Adukkha and life's re-becoming. And five, on aspects of phenomenology and ontology. And on six, bringing it more down to earth with a discussion of relationships. So that's my presentation today. And we have articles appended, a couple of Buddhist suttas. And I would like to thank you for bearing with me today. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. I'm quite open to talking with you about it. It's part of a project. Chapter one. Yes, Dr. Ducini. Thank you for your talk. I just wonder whether you can explain about process thought between people who believe in thought and the people who believe in Buddha. Because is it the different process thought that? Well, let's go back to something in the beginning. And if I can refer to this, it will be very much clearer, I think. <coughs> I gave you some stipulative definitions, and the thing can't be understood without them. Let's see. So here you have, let's see. A little chart. See it now? Yeah. Okay. So you can't mush these all together. Process philosophy means a new way of looking at reality. Instead of thinking about things, like let's say I could hold up a pencil. Don't happen to have one now, but let's use a pen instead. I could hold up a pen. And we can imagine this consists of very many parts, including the refill. We would use a, a noun to designate pen. But when we think more closely, it's a set of interrelated processes that com comprise this as an extended event. Eventually, this will be junk somewhere in a dump. But right now, it's a useful pen because the inter interaction between the parts is skillfully done. So with every single thing, that exists, including, as the Seven Suns Sutta shows, Mount Meru, which looks like it's solid, will last forever. It's shown in the sutta to be erupting, flattening, vegetation and human life are gone. So what we think as a stable thing, whether it be pencil or Mount Meru, is actually a process. That's the short story. Thank you. Another question? Another question? Well, I have my own. Uh, you you Good. were talking about Here. the problem of evil in process theology. And uh, maybe I, ha I may have missed something, but uh, what what is the solution to the problem of evil according to process theology? The solution, the solution is that it doesn't arise. The solution is there is no problem. Why is that? Because it is a problem for people who believe in the perfect being theology. They assert that God is both all-powerful and all-good. And the problem is, you know, the traditional easy logic is, it's more complicated than that, but... If God is all-powerful, he would be able to eliminate all, all okay. evil. Okay. If God is all-good, he would want to eliminate all evil. But evil exists, so God is not both all-powerful and all-good. has been the challenge of 
both people who thought deeply within the Christian tradition and people who are outsiders and think none of this will work. Thank you.